I want to welcome you into to, to part five of what's been a part, uh, five part series on the life of David. Um, what we're trying to do as well, if you want to, we're going to just throw up a QR code on the screen. If you want to get access to the, to the digital notes, you can. We're just trialing this, see how it works. If, if you like it, we'll carry on. Um, if you don't, then I'll, I'll save myself an hour every Saturday. Um, but <laughs> do, do have a look at those. They are in paper form at the back as well, so you can take those. Um, what I'd love you to do with me this morning is turn to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5, where we're looking at the life of David um, and how he fared as a king. And while you're getting there, I just want to tell you a story about, I heard about two men who, who had the same surname and just happened, so happened to live on the same street. One was a pastor and the other was a salesman. And one day the old pastor passed away and, and, and he died. But on the same day, the salesman had to go away to the Middle East on a business trip. And when the salesman arrived, he sent his wife a telegram to, to let her know that he's arrived safely. The problem was they sent it to the wrong address. They sent it to the wife of the now deceased pastor. And you can imagine her horror when she opened the telegram. It said, hi, love, arrived safely. The heat is awful. <laughs> See you Monday. <laughs> if you've got your Bibles open, uh, 2 Chalmers chapter, chapter 5, starting at verse 17, it says this, When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king of Israel. I want to stop there, the Philistines. Why are the Philistines important? Why are the Philistines important to us? Um, well, we know from the Bible the Philistines have been enemies of the Israelites for a long time. If you go back to the uh, time of the judges, uh, if you look at Samson, the, you know, the, the Philistines were the main oppressors of Israel. Actually, if you go back even further into the book of Joshua, it's, it's Israel's failure when they go into the promised land. It says they didn't quite throw everyone out, and it's their failure to fully occupy the land. That, that means the Philistines can grow and actually be a, a force in Israel. So, so even though the, the Israelites had kind of claimed the land, actually there were parts the Philistines were still in control of. And there was loads of internal battles for territory going on within Israel. Actually, the, the Philistines controlled the iron trade. So if you wanted iron, you had to buy it from the Philistines. So when Israel tried to buy iron, they had to buy it from the, their enemies. They had to buy it from the Philistines. And the Philistines is not going to sell their enemies good iron. So they always sold the Israelites the cheap stuff. So you've got the Philistines fighting with this superior armor, superior chariots, superior weapons. And the Israelites fighting... With the chief, with the chief, cheap, cheap stuff. <laughs> it's easy for me to say. Um, and the, the Philistines are actually the main reason. If you go back into the book of 1 Samuel, this is why the Israelites say, God, we need a king. We need a king to defeat these Philistines. And God said to Samuel, listen, I'm going to send you a guy. And it's going to be Saul. And he said, anoint him to be the leader because he will rescue you from the Philistines, and, and, and in fairness, Saul never lived up to kind of what God had given him to do, and, and the Philistines end up being major characters in the lives of, of Saul and David. There's a hundred references to the Philistines in, just in 2 Samuel. Uh, sorry, in, in, sorry in, in 1 Samuel. There's a hundred references, so they're pretty major players. It's the Philistines who, who, who Goliath is, is fighting for. When, when, when David has to fight in Saul's army, it's the Philistines he's fighting against. Where it was the Philistines actually who finally killed King Saul. They're the ones that king, kill King Saul. There's a moment when David is on the run from Saul. Guess who shelters him? The Philistines. And actually, David is very nearly forced to fight in the very battle that, where Saul and his sons get killed. So, so the Philistines are important. And we read in 1 Samuel that, that even though Saul is king, actually the Philistines are probably in charge. Even though this was Israel and Saul was king, the Philistines had, they had control over strategic parts of the kingdom. And what happened, they were kind of happy to let the Israelites rule themselves, as long as they weren't too much of a threat. Church, can I tell you one thing? The enemy is not going to worry about you if you're not much of a threat. Because that's what was happening. The Israelites were allowed to just get on with it. And the Philistines let them get on with it. Because actually, do you know what? They're not much of a threat. I'm going to let them get on with it. But then this happens. David becomes king. And it says this. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king of Israel, they mobilized their forces to capture him. Or they mobilized their forces against him. They knew all about Saul. 
But here comes David. They knew all about Saul. They could deal with Saul. But suddenly, here comes David. And David is a different kettle of fish. They knew how powerful David was. And it's interesting because David, um, David wants to join the Philistine army at one point to fight against Saul. And the Philistines go, no, 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 because we know what you're capable of. They'd heard about David. They'd seen him defeat Goliath. And it's interesting, as David rises to the next step in his calling, all of a sudden, opposition comes against him. Can I tell you, church, that when God is about to do something in your life, the enemy will hear about it, and he'll mobilize his forces. There's no getting away from that. I don't know if you've had any opposition in your life as you've, you've tried to make changes, or you've tried to, to go in a new direction, or you've tried to push forward into the things of God. Suddenly, things come against you. When you decide, okay, God, I'm going to read my Bible more, suddenly more things jump into your diary. God, I'm going to pray more, suddenly more things come into your day. That's not life, that's the enemy saying, no, 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 I'm not going to have you stepping up. When Abraham builds an altar to God, there's opposition from Lot and his servants. When, when Joseph has a dream and he speaks it out in faith, what's the next thing that happens? His brothers chuck him in a pit. Elijah defeats the prophets of Baal in that incredible uh, showdown on Mount Carmel. What happens? There's opposition from Jezebel. Jesus is, is baptized and the Holy Spirit comes on Jesus. What happens next? There's opposition. He goes into the wilderness and he's tempted. You can gu guarantee whenever you step out in anything for God, whenever you step out in faith, whenever you start to take new territory, the enemy will hear about it and he'll show up. And then before this text, we can go back to 1 Samuel. And it's interesting because it says that Samuel, he, David had actually been king for a little while. And it said he spent seven years fighting his own people to try and reunify the nation. Because Israel is kind of split, and he is, he's been king for a while, but he's going around fighting these battles to bring the whole kingdom back together. And you'll see through this that the Philistines don't attack the Israelites that much, because actually they're just fighting with each other. And the Philistines go, well, we don't need to worry about those because they're fighting each other. Church, can I tell you, if we're fighting each other, we're not a threat to anyone else. But the minute they hear the nation is unified, the minute they hear the nation is together, the minute they, they hear that, that the, 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 the nation is united in purpose, suddenly they get nervous. Suddenly they get uncomfortable. Suddenly this united nation is a threat, so they band together. Five Philistine cities come together as one army to rise up against David. Church, the, the enemy isn't going to attack us as a church when we're at war with each other. I'm not saying we are, by the way. But I'm just letting you know, because when we're at war with each other, if we're ever at war with each other, we are not a threat. If we're critical, and I'm, I'm not talking about even this church, I'm talking about the global church. If we're critical of one church, or we're mad at one person, or we're upset with that leader, or, or we're gossiping, or we're complaining, or we're causing division, do you know what? The devil goes, great, they're doing my work for me. That's why Paul and James, you read Paul and James's letters, they say so many times, sort yourselves out. Get your relationships right. Sort out any issues between each other because if you're, not, if you're fighting amongst yourselves, you are not effective and you're not going to take any ground. And it, it's this early part of David's kingship, you can read it through. The Philistines never attack David as long as he's fighting these internal battles. But once they hear the countries unified, once they hear the countries standing together, that's when they attacked. And I know that, that when we stand together, when we stand united in vision, when we stand united in purpose, do you know what? We'll get, get the devil's attention. And I'll tell you this, when we get the devil's attention, I go, great. Do you know why? Because we're doing the right thing. So I know when we come and get up against opposition, do you know what? If we're not being attacked, I get worried. Because if we're not being attacked, then the devil doesn't see us as a threat. So when we do get attacked, I get a little bit relieved because I know it's proof that we're upset in the devil's plans for this town. Anyone with me? Yeah. Right, we've done the first verse. Nine more verses to go. How are we doing? Not very good. Right, we'll keep going. It's interesting because they go to this place. They call it the Valley of Rephaim. And Rephaim is, is Hebrew for the place of giants. So they march out into the place of the giants. They spread out across the valley, and the, the understanding here is they actually form a wall uh, with the, the strongest soldiers on the front line. Now, now look at this. What does David do? He runs to the stronghold. David runs to the stronghold. There's something powerful in that. Even though they're in the valley of the giants, David's a giant killer. 
David's killed giants before. David's beaten the Philistines before. What David didn't do was go, hey, hey, I've seen this before. I can do this just like last time. No problem. I know what I can do. I know what I'm doing. I can do this in my own strength. Even though they're in the valley of the giants and David's a giant killer, he didn't go up to fight. He went down to pray. David was a king that prays. He was a king who went to the place of prayer. And I want to ask this question, and let's be honest, how often when something happens in our lives, when, 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 when things just come into our lives, how often do we rise up when we need to go down? Or how often do we go to the fridge or the wine cupboard or the shops or to people who are going to tell us what we want to hear, how often do we, do, we, do we go up when actually what we do is need to go down? Into that place of prayer, into that place of God's presence. I love the way the NIV puts this, verse 17. It says, the Philistines came up, but David went down. When trouble comes up, he goes down. When problems come up, he goes down. When opposition shows up, he goes down. Even though he's, he's experienced in warfare, he's defeated Goliath, he never got so confident in his own ability, he thought he could do it without God. And he goes into the stronghold. It's this place to pray. Now, we don't know where that stronghold is. Some people say it's the cave where he hid from Saul. Um, we know David's living in Jerusalem, so it might be a place in Jerusalem. We, we don't know where it is, but wherever it is, the, the, the principle is this. David did something he always did when he faced trouble. He ran to his stronghold. He ran to that safe place. He ran to that hiding place. Before he went to stand up to the Philistines, he bowed before God and said, this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Before I'm going to do anything, before I make a move, this is how I fight. And it's just a great principle that David knows. That, and I just, I got this from another pastor. I don't mind admitting, I got this from another pastor, but I loved it. And he said this, for upgraded attacks, we need to upgrade our worship. Because David knew what took courage in one season was going to take consecration in the next. And just like David, we all need a stronghold. We all need that place of safety. We all need a place of security. We all need a place of peace. We need a place where we can draw close to God's presence. We need a place we can go deeper in prayer and in intimacy with God. Psalm 91 says this, those who live in the shelter of the Most High. How do you get into a shelter? You get close to whatever is given the shelter. Those who live in the shelter will find rest. Where? In the shadow. You can't be in in the shadow of something a few miles away from it. It says this, this I declare, he is my refuge. He's my place of safety. He's my God and I trust him. In every battle, he's my refuge. He's my place of safety. He's my God and I trust him. David knew prayer was key. He'd seen, move, he'd seen God move time and time and time again, but he still doesn't move without consulting God. And I just want to just encourage, challenge, whatever way you want to take this. Do you know what? You might have be a giant killer in your life. There may be giants in your life. Do you know what? You've beaten them before. You might know how to defeat certain giants. You might know what to do, but so did David. And he still went to the place of prayer. He still went to God. And his prayer's interesting because his, his words aren't, God, will you help me? His words, are, his words aren't, God, God, will I win this? His first words are, God, do I have permission? Should I go and fight? Is this my fight? Do I have permission to fight the battle that I used to? To fight. You know, we, 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 Hannah alluded to it earlier. We're going through a battle at the moment, and there's times, there's times at this point where I've got to go, God, is this my fight? And I've got to bring it to God. Because I can get angry, I can get upset, I can get uh, distraught. But there's moments where I've got to say, God, is this my fight? Because the battle belongs to God. And I think David's heart is incredible. He, he saw an opportunity to do what he did before, but he still asked God's permission. 
He saw a battle he'd, we'd won many times before, but he still asked God, do I have permission to fight this? So David goes to what we call this, this place of per- permission. Not even David went out in his own strength. You know, we talk about David, a man after God's own heart. He, he, not even David went out in his own strength. Not even the man who killed Goliath went out thinking he could do it his own way. And this is his question, should I go? Is this my fight? And then look at his next question. He said, will you deliver them? Who's getting the credit? God. It's not, will, will, will I defeat them? It's, will you deliver them? Will you defeat them? At no point does he attribute any glory to himself. This is all for God. And what David's doing here is, is, is really simply seeking God's face and not his hand. And sometimes we're really quick to seek God's hand before we seek his face. And the thing I've learned is this, that, that, that if you seek God's hand, he might give you a present. But if you seek his face, he'll give you his presence. There's a difference. That when we seek God's permission, not his provision. When we seek his will, not his wallet. He might give you a present if you seek his hand. God's a good God. He's gracious. He's generous. But if you seek his face, he'll give you his presence. What's in his presence? Fullness of joy. And it's this place of humility, this place of permission that David actually, he gets instructions, he gets inspiration, and he gets insight into how things will work out. God says, yeah, go ahead. I will certainly hand them over to you. And they go out into battle, and it says this. That they went to this place called Baal Perazim and defeated the Philistines there. Look what David says. The Lord did it. How often, even when we've asked God for permission, we've asked God for prayer, we've asked God to be with us, we get the battle, we go, look at me! But David goes, no, 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 the Lord did it. He didn't take any of the glory. It wasn't, it wasn't anything to do with his strength. It wasn't anything to do with his leadership skills. It wasn't anything to do with his fighting ability. God did it. He says he's the God of the breakthrough. And he names the place Baal Perazim, and it means the Lord who, who bursts through or the Lord who breaks through. Um, now, don't get worried, because you're probably going, looking at the name going, hang on, Baal or Baal, that's, that doesn't sound right. That sounds like something they were, they were supposed to be avoiding. Actually, the word Baal, it's, it's a generic term for master um, or, or potentially Lord. So when David says Baal Perazim, he doesn't mean Baal, the, the Assyrian god. He means Baal, the master the master of the breakthrough, the Lord who breaks through. Church, can I tell you, God's the God of breakthrough. God's the God of breakthrough. He's a God of victory. He's a God of breakthrough. And and I've learned this just just looking at this passage and and just letting this soak into me over the last week or two, that the breakthrough isn't determined by the strength of our hands. It's determined by the sensitivity of our ear. It's determined by our willingness to listen to a God who will always give you a strategy to get you through. Can I tell you this much? God's an expert in everything. God's an expert in in every area. There's, There's no area that you're struggling in that God isn't an expert in. So so whatever comes up, if you learn to go down, God can give you instructions. He can give you insight. He can give you inspiration, and that will bring you up. And then you can take on anything the enemy will bring against you. And it says this, our victory comes from our stronghold. It comes from our safe place. It comes from our intimacy with God. David David writes this famous psalm. He says, God, you're my shepherd. You're always with me. And then he says, you prepare a table before me. Where's the table? In the presence of my enemies. My enemies are right there. And here's God getting dinner ready. I'm going to have dinner while my enemies watch. That's how confident I am in God. In another psalm, he says this, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. Everything I need is in your presence. So I'm going to choose to seek your face and not your hand because my joy comes in your presence. Wisdom comes in your presence. Peace comes in your presence. Strength comes in your presence. The Bible says that the, the God searches the earth. Why? To strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. So when we're committed to him, when we're committed to his presence, when we're committed to prayer, when we put him first in our decisions, first in our families, first in our finances, first in our relationships, what happens? He strengthens us for the battle. But we've got to be committed. And we've got to put God 
first. And that's why David found what he needed to win because he was committed to God. And we get this next line. This, this, again, is, is fascinating line because it says that, that when, when the Philistines lost the battle, it says that they abandoned their idols. And that's really interesting to me because these idols weren't like charms you put on your wrist or they weren't bracelets or they weren't necklaces. These are big, heavy statues. Maybe made of gold, silver, bronze, precious metal. And they carried these idols into battle. And it says that when they lost the battle, they abandoned them. So David and his men confiscated them. Actually, the King James Version, if you read the King James, says they burnt them. <coughs> Which is probably what happened after they confiscated them. So there's no mistranslation there. Because actually, God says, you know, get rid of these idols, burn them. So they, they go and do that. And, and I, want to, I want you to see this, because David is king. But when Joshua and Israelites first came into the promised land, they didn't do this. They let them stay. They thought, oh, well, we can control this, we can, we can deal with this, it's okay, we'll, we'll, we'll let them stay. And actually those idols remained, and what happened? It cost them. For hundreds of years it cost them, because they didn't get rid of it right at the start. So, so here's David, and suddenly there's all these idols to a false god, silver, bronze, precious metals, and probably would have been quite valuable. But look what David does. Does he put them on eBay? Does he take them home to put them on his shelf? Does he put them in a museum? No, 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 he burns them. Even though they might be valuable, he burns them because that's what God told him to do. I want to be very careful here, and maybe a little bit strong, but sometimes there are things that we've allowed into our lives that aren't of God. And God says, no, no, don't control it. Don't save it. Don't pack it away. Burn it. It needs to be destroyed. And I'm not suggesting we walk around with an idol in our pockets. But but there are things that we can walk around with that, that isn't from God. Paul says, get rid of bitterness. Get rid of rage. Get rid of anger, harsh words, slander, as well as types of evil behavior. Do you know what? You can't win battles when you're carrying around that sort of stuff. You can't win battles when you're carrying around those things. Uh, Pride, greed, laziness, they they can all become things that actually we choose to put before God. So they can all become idols, and God says, don't put anything before me, and I want to encourage you. If you know you're carrying that into your battle, God say, burn it. Because it's just going to weigh you down. I want you to see in the next verse that the, the, the army... Again, moving on through these verses. The army, David, he thinks he's defeated them. The Philistines run. And look what happens. They come back. They come right back. Same army, same valley. But look what David does. He asks the Lord what to do. David asked again, he's, he's just beaten them, the same army in the same valley. He just prayed, he'd heard God say yes, he's gone and defeated them, and here they are, same army, same place, probably the same battle. What does he do? He goes to pray again. How many times have we won a battle, and the same battles come up, and we've gone, oh, you know what to do, I'll do this the way I did it last time. And I love what David does, says in the Psalms. He says, each morning I bring my request to you and I wait expectantly. Why every morning? Because every day is different. Every morning is different. There's a different battle. There's a different challenge. So I'm bringing my request every day. And if I come every day, I can wait with expectation because I'm committed to you. And this is what God says. God says, listen, don't attack them straight on. What's he saying? Don't fight the way you fought last time. Don't go ahead, go around them, take them on from behind. And God says to David, listen, for a new battle, you need a different strategy. And I wonder sometimes that we think that that God has to work in a certain way. Because God's always done it that way. That that, that God has to perform in, in, in in a manner, in a way that we're used to. because, Or he has to work in a way we're comfortable with. Because that's what God's always done. And I wonder if it's ever occurred to us that God might want to do things a different way. Because you see here with David, it's the same enemy, the same place, but it's two totally different plans. 
God doesn't always work the same way he worked before. You know, Jesus actually, we think Jesus' method for healing people was just putting his hands on them. Can I burst that bubble and tell you Jesus spat on people? Jesus put his fingers in people's ears. He rubbed his spit on their tongue. Sometimes he just said, do you want healing? Go away. And they they got healed on the way back. Sometimes he just spoke healing out. Sometimes he touched people. But he very rarely, if you look at the, the narrative of Jesus' miracles, he very rarely did the same thing twice. Different battle, different strategy. I don't know about the band back up as I start to close. And There's a passage in Isaiah that's, that's all about God uh, promising his presence. Come on, Rich, you can come out. We'll have a bass solo. And Isaiah, and God's talking to Isaiah, or God is talking through Isaiah to the nation, and it says that, 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 that God is saying, you know, I've been with you, and he reminds the people of all the times God's come through for them. He reminds them of all the times of their history, all the battles they've won, all the, the, all the victories they've won. He reminds them of their past, but then he says this, but forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. I'm about to do something new. I've already begun. Don't you see it? I'll make a pathway through the wilderness. I'll create rivers in the dry wasteland. I'm going to do something that's never been done before. I'm going to make paths where there were no ways before. Forget about yesterday's strategy. That was good for yesterday, but it's not good for now. It was good for then, but it's not good for day. The only thing you need right now is to stay close to me. And God would say, listen, what I, what I had you do yesterday is not what you need for today. You can't defeat yesterday's, yesterday's enemy with today's strategy. Sorry, today's enemy with yesterday's strategy. Do you know what? I was watching, I'm not a, a Formula One fan. I can't think of anything worse, to be honest. But can you imagine having a, a, a 1920s Formula One car against a, a, the one that was built in the last couple of months? You can't outrace today's Formula One cars with yesterday's cars. If you're into Wimbledon, you can't defeat today's players with yesterday's rackets. You can't defeat today's illnesses with yesterday's medicine. So you can't defeat today's enemy with yesterday's strategy. God says this, circle around and attack them near the poplar trees. When you hear the sound like marching feet in the tops of the trees, be on the alert. What's God saying? When you hear the leaves rustling, when you hear the wind blowing through the trees, what's the wind a symbol of? Holy Spirit. Jesus said the Spirit's like the wind. He said it blows wherever it likes. You can't can't see it, but you can hear it. Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, the, the, the early church are in, the, 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 in, in whatever room they're in. What happens? There's the sound of a mighty wind. And the Holy Spirit falls on the church. And it's the same meaning in the Hebrew and in the Greek. In the Hebrew, the, the word spirit is ruach. And it means breath sometimes translated wind. In the Greek, it's pneuma. Guess what it means? Breath. So when God talks about the wind, he's not talking about the wind, he's talking about the spirit. And he says, when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the trees. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to march in the top of a tree. But it's a sign that the armies of heaven are marching. It's a sign that God's on the move. It's a sign that God is moving ahead of you to do what? Strike down the enemy. This was never meant to be a test of David's fighting ability. It was meant to be a test of his hearing ability. I said, David did what the Lord commanded. He waited for the sound of the wind, and when he heard it, he, he, he heard the army of God going ahead, and he struck down the Philistines. Actually signals the end of the Philistines' dominion over Israel. They, they don't quite go away yet, but this defeat kind of signals the, the beginning of the end. By the time David dies, the Philistines are no longer a threat to Israel. 
But it comes about not because David's a good fighter, not because he's a good leader, not even because he's a good king. It comes about because David was a good listener. David knew the battle belonged to God. David knew that he had to fight his battles on his knees before he could fight them on his feet. And I want to suggest very carefully, some of us have been trying to fight battles on our feet for too long. And we haven't been getting anywhere. And maybe God's allowing the enemy to put so much pressure on you that actually it's forcing you to your knees. And that's where God wants you. He wants you to get you to your knees and say, God, I surrender. God, the battle belongs to you. God, I need you. So from now on, this is how I fight my battles. Whenever trials come, this is how I fight my battles. When life gets tough, this is how I fight my battles. When I can't see a way out, This is how I fight my battles. When I don't know what to do, this is how I fight my battles. When I feel helpless, this is how I fight my battles. When I don't have the strength, this is how I fight my battles. Church, read it by your heads. I want to ask two questions. Are you in a battle right now? And the answer should be yes. And the second question is, how are you fighting it? And if you're in a battle right now, I want to encourage you to take a posture of surrender. If you're physically able to kneel in a moment, maybe you can kneel. If, if, if you're not, maybe just, just open your arms wide and surrender. Don't, don't, don't carry the TV. Don't carry anything. Just open your arms wide and say, God, this is how I fight my battles. Arms open wide. Surrendered to you. Surrendering my will. Surrendering my control. Surrendering my agenda. Surrendering my strategies. Surrendering my expertise. Surrendering my experience. And I'm going to let you be God. I'm going to let you be Lord because it's your fight it's your battle the battle belongs to you so just where you are why don't you just start to surrender your battles let him fight on your behalf listen for that rustling in the trees listen for the army of God moving ahead of you that that in Jesus name sicknesses are healed that in Jesus' name, cancer is defeated. In Jesus' name, brain issues are healed. That depression is broken in Jesus' name. That anxiety is turned to boldness in Jesus' name. That poverty turns to provision in Jesus' name. Church, whatever your battle is, I just want to encourage you, whatever you're facing, declare this morning, this is how I fight. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles now. This is how I'm going to fight any battle that might come before me. Just wherever you are, make that declaration. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. You might want to stretch your arms out. You may want to kneel. But put yourself in that posture. Instead of going up, take yourself down.